man, you guys just don't even prepare at all. And I was like, nope, we that's, really don't. That's our thing. <laughs> all right, are you ready? I find the game by game stats. Uh, stats are overrated. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready? What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Team Raw Podcast, where we do our three favorite things, talk a little bit of booze, a little bit of beer, and a whole lot of basketball. Ladies and gentlemen, the tall guy and I lied to you. We missed another week. Sorry. It happens. But the tall guy and I are back for another podcast, and we are joined this week by a very special guest, a friend of the pod. You've heard him before. His name is Big Mike, and he joins us again tonight. Thanks for having me back on, guys. Always happy to have you here, Big Mike. But yes, everyone, we are sorry. Life got in the way. We missed a week, but we promise that we probably won't do that again, right? We promise to try. We promise to try. We're just a couple of guys doing our best, all right? Yeah. Don't judge us too much. And uh, for those of you looking at us on YouTube, you might notice our background is a little different because I recently moved, hence the we missed last week. One of the reasons. So uh, I moved. We are in a new um, apartment in a different spot. So the recording might sound a little bit different. We're still in a work in progress fr- trying to soundproof the place. So it's a work in progress, but hopefully we sound okay for you guys. And uh, because we've got a lot to talk about this podcast, a lot has happened. Yes, it really has. We're officially in the finals now. The the apex of what NBA basketball is, what we talk about all year. Not a good time to miss a podcast, but hey, we're back again. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, not a uh, good time to miss a podcast, but we are here to talk a lot about the finals. We thought we would give our takes on the finals in a fun way. Michael and Mitch have each created a list of their top 10 players in the finals. And we'll compare, contrast their list and kind of just see who we, who the big names are and who we think are going to make big impacts going forward for the next uh, three games, next four games, depending on how many it goes. How it goes. But uh, we are recording this Tuesday night, so you guys will see this tomorrow morning, Wednesday morning, so right before game four of a huge game where the Bucks try to even it up against the Suns, who currently have a 2-1 lead. Yeah, but before we get into all of that... I think that it's time we talk about what we're drinking tonight. The fun part of the podcast. Yes. And we have video so you can see we are drinking Jameson whiskey and not just any Jameson. We are drinking the Caskmates IPA edition. Um, What makes this kind of interest, this particular uh, type of Jameson interesting is that they use old barrels that had been used to create IPAs like beers and then they repurpose them and then they use it to create this new type of whiskey. It's good stuff. Yeah, it's solid. It's, it's really fun. Um, I know this is a a favorite of the tall guys, but it is very fun to drink something that is like got a decent amount of history to it. Jameson is a very old whiskey. I'm looking at the bottle. It says 1780 on it, which, which means old. And, and Mike (laughs) actually picked this particular one out. So what do you think, Mike? I like it a lot. I've actually never had the IPA edition before. Uh, this one's actually a little bit smoother, I think, a little less bite than the uh, regular stout one. So, you know, I like it a lot. Yeah, we'll definitely get into the taste and break that down a little bit more. But Mitch, you normally have a little bit of a uh, history lesson for us. So. Yes, I do have a history lesson for you. First bit of history is I spent my study abroad in Ireland and I went to this distillery and it was amazing and it changed my life as study abroads do for everybody. Um, But a little bit about the actual distillery of Jameson is that it started out in 1780 as the Steins family Bow Street distillery, which Bow Street is where the distillery still lives. But then a Scotsman. Not an Irishman, a Scotsman by the name of John Jameson showed up in Ireland and then he started becoming the main distiller for them, kind of created the first blend of the Jameson whiskey and then ended up becoming the owner in 1806. And ever since then, they've become one of the world's biggest whiskey distributors. That's heartbreaking. Right? Jameson is not an Irish person. It's not made. Yeah. Jameson, like the most Irish of names 
is not actually an Irish dude. That is earth shattering. I'm okay. Yeah, but I'm sorry. Not. Sorry to break your brains like that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that is that's kind of cool that like Jameson like is more diverse than I thought it was, given that it's got some Scottish roots and but it was based in Ireland and it had a different name, which is sounds like a mouthful of a name, to be honest with you. Like that sounds just Yeah, like I like I like Jameson better. Wouldn't be drinking the Steins family whiskey, whatever it is. But Jameson is a beautiful yeah. thing. It's gone through a lot of like ups and downs. Um, when America hit the prohibition, they weren't like they couldn't ship into America, so they go to Canada. But then they uh, Ireland broke off from Britain, and then they were taxing and tariffing everything they were sending. And Canada is a part of the Commonwealth with England, so then they couldn't send to them anymore. So they actually almost went out of business. But we are happy to still have them and have them on the podcast today. Yes, thanks, Jim. You're here. I love Jameson. Oh yeah. But getting back to basketball here, we have. A pretty extensive list to get through 10 names. I mean, two different lists of 10. So let's, let's jump into this because we have a lot to get through. Um, you guys want to start at 10 or do you guys want to start at one? Let's start at one. Start at one. All right. Cause I, I feel well, like that's you guys, how I feel, I feel like you guys will have a lot more diversity towards the end. So let's start at one. Michael, why don't you give us our most important player in the finals? The best, the most marquee person to watch. Uh, number one, I got Devin Booker. I mean, he's the Suns' main guy. Uh, he's a guy that could score from anywhere. And, like, he's the guy on the Suns that you got a game plan for. And you're, like, you got to put your best defender on him, and you got to know where he is at all times. So, for me, it's number one is Devin Booker. That's very interesting. So, to clarify, we're going over like the best through the playoffs so far for these two teams. Like who have been the best contributors and like most important guys, right, Mike? Yeah. That's how I made my list. So I hope that's how you made yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're good. We're on the same page. Well, my number one is not Devin Booker. My number one is the Greek freak himself, Giannis Antetokounmpo, because the Bucks are just nothing without Giannis. Like they're barely a playoff team. This guy has been putting up mad stats all playoffs long he pretty much is like single-handedly handedly willing them into winning into like in, only winning one game in the finals so far but he's averaging like 36 points per game in the three games so far and he's been absolutely killing it yeah absolutely stud uh Giannis has played very well the best player in the finals so far but that being said Devin Booker has a very good argument here. So why don't you both get on your player's soapbox? Mitch, I'll let you start since Michael went first off the beginning and just convince me. Convince me why Giannis is the number one player in this series. All right. My first argument is who won the last two MVPs? Not this year, but the two years before this. Hold on. That was you most said, valuable. You, oh, playoffs. No, no, you you on, said no, this list. Oh, oh, you said, you said this list. Your, you said yourself that this list was based on playoff performance and who's doing yeah, best but right I need, now. I need to preface the narrative of who right. this guy is. He is. Do you see the goalpost moving already? No, it's like he's already moving. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm setting the narrative. Okay, Giannis is the two-time MVP. He's a defensive player of the year. We expect him to go in and dominate games. We expect him to be the best player in all of these series, to be the best player on the Bucks every every time. And there has been a couple of games, namely the ones where he was like actually hurt and gone, but a couple of games where he was not the best player on his team. With the Suns, you can kind of t like pick and choose who is your best player in any given game. A lot of time bookers may be scoring the most, but he may not be the most important player on that team. Giannis is always going to be the catalyst that does everything for the Bucks. So basically Mitch says he got hurt. He was an MVP and okay, his so name is Giannis. What I'm saying is he got hurt. And those are the only time when he wasn't the best player on his team. I'm just joking. Michael, go. You're messing with me. Well, I will agree with one point that Mitch made and that it's the butts go as far as Giannis goes most games. But we have seen that there have been a few games where he's had some clunkers and they've lost games that they should have won in the playoffs. And like lots of missed free throws. <laughs> like that would really have helped them, you know, make this path to the finals a whole lot easier. 
And then let's not also forget that if Kevin Durant had a you know slightly smaller foot, well, whose fault he is wouldn't that? even be here. So <laughs> it certainly wasn't Giannis's. I mean, he had a clean look at the basket and he made it. So and Giannis got hurt for a couple of games against the Hawks, and the supporting cast was still able to rise up and win those games. And I understand that Trey Young also had his injury issues. But the core around Giannis is still pretty solid. So, I mean, I, I still think that Devin Booker is the main marquee guy in this finals. He's the guy that's going to give you the highlight plays. He's the guy that you want the ball in his hands for a last second shot over anybody else in the series, I believe. So here's my thing. And I'm, I'm going to like jump ahead a little bit because I think that Devin Booker isn't even the most important guy on his team. Cause my number two is Chris Paul. Wow. I wow. don't even have Devin Booker mm. as my number two because the Suns don't even make the playoffs maybe this year. If Chris Paul is not in this team, but now they're a finals team and it's because of Chris Paul and his importance. So quick side note. I hope you guys both brushed up on your debate tactics because I'm, be- I'm, I'm, I'm seeing something brew here. So, I mean, round one, let's just, let's just get into this round one. We have Booker versus Giannis. Both of you guys made solid arguments. I, 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 I see both of your points, but it seems like Mitch has already brought us to round two. Mitch has Chris Paul in at number two. Yeah. So I have Chris Paul coming in at number two. I think that he it really is. He's the heart and soul. He's the engine. He is the guy that has led the Suns to in crazy heights that none of us really thought that they even had a chance at at the beginning of this season. I mean, Ethan and I deferred. Ethan thought that they were going to be really good. You thought they were going to be a you know top three, four seed going oh, into the yeah. season. Yeah. But I was, I mean, I had very low expectations for them. I thought that they were going to be fighting for a playing spot. And then that with the addition of Chris Paul is really the only difference between last year's team and this year's team. Maybe Aiton's progression that he's made this year as well. That is what has made this team a finals contender and one of the best teams in the entire NBA. And so that's why I think Chris Paul is the most important guy. And he's shown that throughout these playoffs as well, that he is incredibly important to what they're doing out there. They look like a seasoned team. And a lot of that is because of the veteran leadership that he brings. I mean, I'll, I'll push back a little bit here. And I, and I, I, again, I'm just playing moderator here. Yeah. I'm just kind of like the, the, the Suns team has grown a lot, not necessarily just because you had a guy like Jay Crowder, who's one of the best glue guys in the NBA. You had a guy like Mikhail Bridges who took huge steps forward and you have arguably the six man of the playoffs in Cameron Payne. Those are like three huge contributors that, weren't necessarily there on last year's team that are. So I don't know if it's just Chris Paul. That being said, I do agree with you that Tris, Chris Paul, that the Suns team is not not necessarily a playoff team if they don't have Chris Paul on that roster. So I understand what you're saying, but I don't necessarily agree with that Chris Paul is the only person that joined this team and he's the only reason that they're there. So Mike, who do you have in as your number two guy? So at two, I had Giannis. And for many of the reasons that you stated, uh, you know, about Giannis being your number one, I, you know, don't necessarily disagree with. I just think that, uh, like, Devin Booker has been the man. So that's why I put Devin Booker one, and now I'm putting Giannis two. Uh, For many of the reasons that you put, like, Giannis has played well for most of the playoffs. I mean, he's averaging almost 30 uh, with 13 boards, I mean, that's amazing. So he has had those games where he's put the team on his back. Uh, it's just there have been times where you just wanted a little bit more from him, but he still is the most important player on that team, and he is the Greek freak for a reason. You know, it's extremely hard to guard him unless you are coordinating all five guys on your defense to – like really defend in the key. And then that opens things up for other guys. And I totally agree. Giannis is not like as good as we think we want him to be because like I, because he doesn't really have much of a bag. He kind of just runs straight at you and you just have to deal with him. And he's either going to make like make the dunk or get past you for a dunk or like make the layup and just go through you or you man up and body him up. And hopefully he has to take a fade away. He's not a good free throw shooter. Like, he was like a 69% free throw shooter in the regular season, which is 
subpar. But then in the playoffs, he had everyone counting <laughs> during to his free throws, and that yeah. was deep in his head. So I totally agree with you. He's he's not. He's not like Michael Jordan out there. He's not like watching LeBron James out there where it's like, oh my God, what a complete player. What an amazing, great basketball player. He's more of just a force of nature than anything else. So I, I, I heard a very like interesting argument about Giannis, and we can go on a small tangent about this, but uh, a guy on the radio, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Greeny um, saying on, on ESPN radio, but he was saying that Giannis is basically this generation's Shaq. Where he it's he's skilled, yes. You have to be skilled to be in the NBA, but his skill level isn't good enough to be in the NBA compared to like his just raw athleticism. Like if he wasn't as crazy athletic and just naturally gifted as his, as he was or as he is, he's not skilled enough to be in the NBA. Does that make sense? Like yeah, he he's his skill level is not on par with the average NBA player, but he's just so raw and gifted and like just naturally athletic that it kind of covers up for those lack of just like nuances of basketball. Yeah. I mean, to me, he's kind of Kevin Durant without the amazing skill that Kevin Durant has. I mean, you know, he still has an amazing first step. He's incredibly explosive. Once he gets down the key, like He's a great finisher, but you pull him outside of the key and he has a lot of trouble scoring and facilitating to his teammates. Yeah, absolutely. I, I saw a stat where he is 22 of 23 in his shots within the key in the last two games, which is incredible. I mean, that's just stupid stats, but that just means that it shows that if you look at his box score, you take him outside of the paint and he's not effective at all. So it, it you, in, in Giannis's um, case, he, it's very similar to, like I said earlier, Shaq, where for the first 40 minutes of the game, 45 minutes of the game, if you can, you, you can't stop him because you get in the paint and then it's tough. When it comes crunch time, everyone just is like, you need to get yourself a bucket you need another guy and that's where the bucks are going to struggle is they need another guy to create their own shot where Giannis, you either need to feed him in the post or get him in transition. Other than that, he's kind of, he's, he's, he's in the half court. He struggles completely, but that is a tangent, but yes, what were you saying? Yeah. Well this, I mean, that's actually something I've been saying a lot this last year is Giannis is the modern day Shaq. I mean, the 22 of 23 in the paint, is a shack like stat. It's amazing. And he, uh, he alters the way that the game is played. Certainly he struggles down the stretch because he can't just get his own bucket. He has that little like one legged fadeaway that he does every once in a while, but that's why you need guys like, uh, Chris Middleton on his team that like can create. I mean, Shaq always had a hard time winning a championship when he didn't have a Kobe Bryant or he didn't have a Dwayne Wade on his team. I still think that Giannis is the best and most important player in this series because if he has a bad game, the Bucks could just bl get blown out by 20. And that's why I think that he's the number one most important guy. And then the reason I think Chris Paul is the number two most important guy is that he is like that engine that feeds the Suns. And if he has kind of an off night, yeah, you have Devin Booker there that can step up but it's going to be a struggle for them because he is kind of like the brain of that team and it kind of makes them go where they want to like get to where they need to be and organize the entire offense. And then that's why I have guys like Middleton and Booker a little lower where like they might be your closers. They might be the, the shot maker at the very end, but I don't think that they're necessarily the most important cog or best player throughout the playoffs on their individual teams. Yeah, I mean, the teams are constructed very differently. And as they say in boxing, like, styles make fights. And there are two very different style teams here. It's taken both teams a while to kind of tinker with certain players to figure out, like, okay, how do we build around our stars? And that's why I find, like, this series so interesting. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's funny. The Suns had to add Chris Paul. The Bucks had to add Drew Holiday, and both of them had to have a stroke of luck a bit to get to the finals. You know, the, the Bucks needed Kevin Durant's shoe size to be two sizes too big to make sure that they didn't lose and get knocked out. And the Suns have been very fortunate with a lot of injuries throughout the, their playoff run. So 
it you're right they have two very different styles but both of them have gotten here in similar type of fashions yeah and 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 it's very very interesting and very very fun to look at these contract contrasting styles but um it has also like led to a very clunky first couple of games so I'm the the teams are starting to figure their, themselves out. I think game four is going to be very, very interesting. I think a lot of changes will be made on both sides, just like game plan wise, defensively matchups, all that. I think there's a lot to come. That being said, let's move on to your number three most or Michael, have you said your number two? Yeah, you said Giannis. So let's move on to your most important three, their third most important player in the series. Um, Mitch, why don't you start this time? All right. Um, my third most important guy was Devin Booker because I think that Devin Booker is the big time shot maker for the Suns. I mean, Chris Paul is only going to go out there and average 18 and 10. I mean, I say only, but that's amazing. He's going to go out there and average 18 and 10 or 20 and 10 and kind of orchestrate what's going on. But the guy who's going to put the ball in the bucket is Devin Booker. He is your go to like we need we need a game winning shot. Booker's our guy. And he's been nothing but amazing throughout this entire playoff run. He's He held the team up when Chris Paul went down due to the COVID protocols. He's really stepped up to the, the stage for a kid that hasn't even been into the playoffs yet. It has been very, very, um, I, I'm going to say remarkable for what he's done so far. And so he's my number three. Yeah, it's it's so impressive how well he's played and just the amount of composure that he's had um, through these playoffs is just incredible. And his, his, like, we're seeing the blossoming of him and DeAndre Ayton in this playoffs to the point where I think the rest of the NBA needs to be on notice to where, like, you know, you've got a young duo there that is absolutely filthy and dangerous. Yes, they needed Chris Paul to get this far. Yes, I agree that Chris Paul is probably the most important player on that team, but neither Booker nor Aiton have are, have even touched their primes yet. And the fact that they're playing this well, it should put the NBA on notice and it should be scary. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Devin Booker has been a star for a while. I just think he's been disadvantaged as far as just playing in a smaller market, uh, small market, even though Phoenix is a top 10 populated city, but as far as media wise, a smaller market, but DeAndre Ayton has really just had a coming out party in these playoffs. I mean, he was good his rookie year. He was solid. This year, he's been very good. But in the playoffs, he's been top notch. So I think DeAndre Ayton and Devin Booker will get a lot more publicity now that they've made this uh, playoff run. And you're going to see a lot more of that. Yeah, you know, the thing that really uh, like bothered me for a long time with the Devin Booker thing is everyone called him an empty calorie guy, the empty stats dude. Like he like w- like he went out and put out 71 points in a loss and I think that almost like chased people the wrong way. It's like, "Oh, you're just out there getting stats. You're just out there trying to get buckets. You don't care if you win or lose." I think he's always had this dog in him. I think he's always been a guy who cares more about winning than the stats, but he's never had a team around him that like really matters. I mean, it goes to show that I don't think there really is like an empty stats calorie guy, unless you really do care about just getting your stats over winning, but usually it's just a really good player on a bad team. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so like interesting to me that like it took this playoff series to get everyone to start being like, man, this guy, it reminds you a lot of Kobe. He reminds you a lot of a young Kobe or and not a young, an older Kobe. He's got like that old Kobe game with the face up game. He's got that bas- the back to the basket game. I mean, if you look up his defensive numbers, especially in this playoff series, I mean, uh, when he was guarding Drew Holiday and Chris Middleton in game one of the finals so far, they shot two of 17 when he was a primary defender. When they, when they uh, moved to game two, it went, I don't know the exact numbers, but it was something along the lines of like eight for like 30 something. Like he's got a dog in it. He's got that grit. He's got that grind. He's got that mentality. Like it's there. It's just, it took the, you know, the mainstream media, the people like us who don't watch a lot of Suns games to know, like to them to be in the playoffs to kind of notice. And really the big thing that put everybody on watch was them doing so well in the bubble last year. 
But before we go off way so far on a Booker tangent, Mitt, Michael, who do you have as your number three? So at number three, I have uh, Chris Middleton. Just for some of the reasons that we were talking about, uh, Giannis is primarily an inside you know, scorer, and you need Middleton to space the floor, first of all, but also to take those late-game shots. He's hit a few late-game shots in the playoffs that they wouldn't be in this position without Chris Middleton. So he was truly like the perfect match for Giannis because he's able to defer to Giannis when he's open, but able to create his own shot when he's not. And it's shown like he's been really good scoring almost 23 points a game and grabbing almost eight boards. Yeah. That that's super impressive and very important to note that like Middleton is kind of a selfless superstar when it's very hard to like, you know, be the Batman to Robin to, or the Robin to, wow, to be the Robin to Giannis's Batman in that, like Giannis is going to grab all the headlines. Giannis is when Giannis is averaging the numbers that he is, if they lose, it's not going to be on Giannis. It's going to be on everybody else. And he is part of the everybody else. And like, yeah, Middleton has been an absolute assassin these playoffs, but when it does come to Middleton, it is feast or famine. Yeah. He's either amazing or horrible, right? It's like the, uh, he is, he is kind of your go-to guy when it comes to the end. And I will say Middleton is an all-star, but he's not a superstar. He is, if he's on any other team, people probably don't really know or care who Chris Middleton is, right? Like if he played on the Pacers, people like maybe he's an all-star because he's like, a 20 to 25 point per game guy. But when he plays on this Bucks team, he is an absolutely vital role and he has to hit those late game shots. It goes all the way back to game one against the heat where they lose that. If they lose that first game, they might lose to the heat in the first round, but he hits the game winner. And so he is absolutely vital to what this team does. So weird question that again might lead to a tangent. So we'll try to cut it short, but if you put Victor Oladipo in Chris Middleton's position, is he as effective as Chris Middleton? I'd say no. I don't think so either. Um, I think they play slightly different games. Old Depot, I think, needs the ball in the key a little more. He gets uh, some of his shots more through driving to the hole, where Giannis is clogging it and attracting all five guys. Where Middleton can hit the mid-range, and he shoots good enough from three. Or That's not exactly Old Depot's game. Fair enough. Fair enough. Absolutely. Well, so let's... Both of you guys, Mitch, you go first. Recap your top three so that everyone kind of understands where we're at here. So Mitch's top three is? Giannis, Chris Paul, Devin Booker. And then Michael has? Booker, Antetokounmpo, and Middleton. All right. So we just first graded our way through that. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm going to make this really easy for you. My fourth guy is Middleton. So All right. So, so nat- a natural. I'll make okay. this really easy right. for you guys. He, I mean, like I was just saying, he is the most important player at the end of the game because Giannis might have the ball in his hands and he might go to the hoop, but there will be three guys standing right there. And Middleton will be the one that is shooting that last second shot. And he needs to be able to hit those shots. And he's a great shooter. Nothing against Middleton. He is a great shooter. He can do a little bit off the bounce, um, but he's going to be the one that has to make these last second shots if they want to win the championship, I think. Yeah. He's going to need to step up in a way that, a normal guard doesn't. Um, which is why he's an all-star. He's an all-star. He, he's not he a need, superstar. He needs though. to play like an all-star yeah. for them to make it. Um, yeah, I, I would agree that Middleton definitely needs to be playing better than ha- he has so far in the finals in order for them to win it all. But he has showed that he has the oppor- the ability to, um, to definitely play a lot better and to be a like contributor on a championship basketball team. Yeah, and he's had his moments. Uh, it's, But, yeah, I agree. They, it hasn't been 100%, you know, all the time. Not every game has been stellar. But he has had his moments where he's lifted the butts. And he's won games where they probably shouldn't have won. So, you know, I think he's individually talented. Like, you know, Mitch is talking about if he's an all-star or a superstar. I don't disagree with him. I just think with pairing with Giannis, like his importance becomes greater just because of how he plays. 
um, kind of going back to how these teams are constructed. Yeah, yes. totally agree. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Michael, who do you have as your number four? So at four, I have Chris Paul. And for many of the reasons that Mitch was mentioning, he really is the ultimate glue guy. I mean, pretty much anywhere he's been throughout his career, he's made that team better. Uh, still hasn't got the elusive title, but you do see marked like, improvement in those teams, and he's definitely done that here in Phoenix. Uh, he's really brought along uh, Devin Booker to probably be more of a leader, and then he's definitely brought along DeAndre Aiden to be more assertive. And I think a lot of their progress you could really attribute to Chris Paul. Sorry, just complete side note. I have a cat. Leo the cat is in here. And Leo de Basil. The, the cat is He's scratching away. Doing his thing. Come you here, can try to grab him if you want. Um, so here is a funny side note uh about this finals and Chris Paul is I don't know if you guys remember, but Chris Paul was on the move this offseason, right? And everyone was talking about who's going to get Chris Paul. And he ended up choosing Phoenix pretty much. But the team that every that was heavily talked about for the longest time was the Milwaukee Bucks. The Milwaukee Bucks were the like kind of the front runners, like the media favorite for Chris Paul going to them. And it's funny to me to think about how they're p- facing each other now in the finals how much better the Bucks would be if they had Chris Paul. Cause like you were saying, he, he really is the ultimate glue guy. I mean, he's not the guy that's going to go put up 30 for you every night, but your team is always going to be better because you have Chris Paul on it. And so I, it doesn't surprise me that we have pretty much the same four players in our top four. Yeah. The, the fact that you guys are just trading players in the top four tells me that those top four are the top four. Um, they are the best players in this series. Two from each team, which is, Worth noting, I mean, I think I agree with Mitch saying that Chris Paul is basically offensive lubricant. He just makes everything on offense easier, and he's basically a coach on the floor um, during, you know, the other parts of the game, you know, defensively in transition when he's off ball, basically. But, um, yeah, I, I let, let's get one more player off the board before we take a break here, and let's – let's uh, we got to kind of pick it up because, at, per usual, we are uh, – we're going over. Again. We're going over. We're going long. So, Michael, I'm interested to hear who's your number five because there's really two guys here to choose from. I would agree. There's two guys, and I put DeAndre Aiden uh, has really had a huge coming out party here in the playoffs. He's honestly just been incredible. Uh, almost 17 points a game, 12 boards, and then his defense has been great. Uh, he played very well against Anthony Davis in the first round before Anthony Davis got hurt. He played very well against Jokic, uh, this year's MVP. And then he's been right on the other side of all those lobs. So he's been great. Yeah, he, he DeAndre Ayton has found himself in a position to where he has become a max type of player. And it took... 15 playoff games for the regular media to be like, oh, wait. This guy's really worth being the number one overall pick because you look back at that draft, it was him, Bagley, Luca, and Trey Young were really the top guys. And Luca and Jaron Jackson were were up there, but like those five guys, and then but it was like Luca and Trey Young were like the two standouts. And then it was kind of him and Jaron Jackson and then Bagley being the the bust. But he has solidified himself as part of the best part of that draft class and has just been an absolute stud, definitely worth a, a max. Yeah, you know, DeAndre Ayton, his rookie year, definitely got overshadowed by the whole, oh, wow, Luke is already a superstar thing. The great, fun numbers that Trey Young was putting up and got overlooked a little bit. But the big thing that everyone had issues with, with DeAndre Ayton, was uh, his defense. Everyone's like, oh, well, okay, so you can shoot. You have a nice touch. You got a nice little post game, but you should be a great defender. Look at how big you are. Look at how athletic you are. Look at how smart you are. Like, he knows the game really well. It's like, why are you not a better defender? And that was the thing that plagued him for a long time. And it's fun to see the quotes coming out right now about how much Chris Paul has been the the best thing that ever happened to him in his career and how much he loves Chris Paul and how important he's been to him. Um, I think Chris Paul's really taught him the game a little bit more and how to see it as a big man on the defensive side, because that is 
you're right, where he stepped up huge in these playoffs, being able to guard Nikola Jokic, being able to guard Anthony, you know, the, the stable of big men that the Lakers were throwing at him, like being able to go out and play. And he's pretty much one and one in Giannis this entire series. And the, the strides that he has made this year, you're right. He has got to be a max player. You have no choice but to max him because someone else will if you don't. Big men are all of a sudden really important in this league, as we've seen in the last couple of playoffs. And he is just showing himself to be better and better. And he's not even scratch, scratching the surface of like what his talent actually is. Yeah, the, the guy is an untapped potential. Super, super, super malleable. Like like Clay, you can kind of mold him into anything you want at this point. He's kind of good at both sides of the ball at this point. He, yeah, he's actually a very unre- unrelated, well, underrated passer, which is very important and all that. Um, but yeah, you, you talk about his defense night and day compared to this year to last year. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. And I think that he has best big man in the NBA, almost MVP type potential. Yeah, I would totally agree. I mean, you just look at him and he he's a beast. I mean, he's super big, but also super chiseled. Like he has the yeah, he has the body to play in the modern day NBA. And uh, I think part of it is he just was in Phoenix, and so until Phoenix made this run, people kind of forgot about him. But he's always been uber talented. Uh, I was lucky enough. Uh, to see him in person uh, at Arizona. And, you know, he did the same thing there. I mean, he's just a freaking nature. And it's it just taken him a little bit of time to figure it out. But, you know, we're seeing that now in the NBA at the end of year two. For those of you watching on YouTube, you can see our uh, social media guru. That is Mac. She's in the background. I think she's trying to get Leo. She's stealing uh, Leo from She's us. stealing the cat. You can... Th- Leo there she Basil, goes. don't leave. There's the cat no, running away. No. <laughs> oh, she's running away. Okay. <laughs> Fun side note. I'll, 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 I'll just randomness on the Team Morale podcast. But yes, that Michael has DeAndre Ayton coming in as number five. Mitch, who do you have? DeAndre Ayton is my number five. Wow, that uh, right. number yeah, five you know very easy. Is that the first one we've gotten? The same. The same. Yes, that is the first identical go. number. That's um, a nice way to DeAndre like, Ayton. I honestly, as a like guy who didn't make a list i would have i think deandre Ayton at five is a very good number for him yeah i think i think it's very i think you have your top four players the top two on each team and then DeAndre i think he's Ayton the best is, other in the series i think the other other which we'll talk about after we talk we about will yes Austin, uh is also very important though. yes yes but before we get into that wow hold See on that natural transition there but before we do hey <laughs> Looks good on you, baby. Let's talk about what we're tasting in this Jameson. Um, I will say it is lighter than your average Jameson. I, I, I've had a lot of Jameson in my day. You're welcome. <laughs> a little ASMR <laughs> second. Also, AS Medicine. We introduced him last podcast. Uh, a new a member while of Team ago. Morale. New member of Team Morale. He will be back again. But yes, he is the king of pouring stuff while we do stuff. But yes, it is much lighter than your uh, average Jameson. It even has like notes on the bottom of the bottle of like what it's kind of supposed to be. So it's crisp citrus, light hops and floral aromas. Do you like it, Michael? I do. And usually when you think of Jameson, you think of like really dark, uh, bitter, you know, something that's really going to have a lot of bite and You don't get that with this Jameson, but you still get like that punch that you want when you drink, you know, a little bit of Jameson. And you could definitely tell that, you know, it was more of a fruity IPA that they put this Jameson into. And it definitely gives it definitely a lighter taste, a little more citrusy. And then, uh, yeah, definitely not a stout like you're used to. I, I would agree in that, like, I can kind of taste like the hops of like a like hazy type of IPA type yes. thing. Like you, you can tell that they made this. And again, Mitch said this, I think off mic, um, that you, it was made to be like tasted af- while drinking an IPA. You're supposed to like kind of mix the two. 
and I can see that it would pair very, very, very well with like a juicy, hazy IPA. Yeah, it's basically like the sh- like you take the shot of Jameson and as you're sipping on your IPAs and they're supposed to be complementing each other, which makes a lot of sense when you make it with the IPAs. It's got a nice story, has a really nice touch. And you guys are right. It definitely it's lighter. It's I would say like if you're designing it to be drink with IPAs, IPAs are notoriously hoppy, kind of tough to put down. So you almost want something that's refreshing and light and crispy, like it says on the uh, on the bottle. When you're taking like your little sips or a little shot of Jameson with your beer, that's why it really starts to like complement each other. And I really like it. I've had it with IPAs before. They actually do this fun promotion where in your area, they tell you what's the best IPA to drink it with. I got to go look back. It wasn't the Dallas Blonde, but it was the same. Uh, it was like a deep Elm brewery ipa that they chose and they tell you like what beer in your area does it pair best with there's nothing more irish than like hold on you like ipas those don't have enough alcohol for you take shots <laughs> take hold shot on with it. rip some shots while we're drinking ipas because that's what we do here in ireland and or i guess scotland no ireland just because it's a scotsman he embraced the irish culture jameson is irish okay i don't care about if he's scotsman or not but yes. Yeah, if you need a chaser to wash down your stout, <laughs> get some more whiskey. <laughs> you know, they actually have a stout edition of this too. Oh my god. Oh, we're going down a rabbit hole. But yes, I, I would I would agree. It, it, it does have the light hops. I, I get the citrusness. It's very crisp and it you it, it tastes light. I took the first sip and I told Mitch off mic, it was like, wow, this is like the Coors light of uh of whiskeys and that it was just like so light and easy to drink and i get don't one. insult them like that that's what i said i was offended immediately i oh I'm my god going with that well but hold yes. on hold on hold on <laughs> it's like well if you're drinking heavy ipas you need something light and easy and i was like that is light and easy like me ethan is drinking it without ice which is an issue that is a good point that, that I'm just, that's if, I, if, if I'm drinking, drinking without, without I, cringing every time <laughs> I, I, I'm just saying that's that's got to be worth noting here that is a very good point it Ooh. still just feels like an insult though <laughs> all right what would you rather me pick a different beer I could have I could have said natty light yeah we'd be fighting if uh, you were natty light I did yeah. I chose Coors Light which a lot of people like Coors Light so rolling rock it's the- oh my god <laughs> it looks similar it's got the I, green going you. Anyways, let's jump into your number six players here. I'm assuming you both have the same player at number six based on what you guys said earlier. I have Drew Holiday. Do you disagree? I do not disagree. Oh, look at us. Two in a row. So Drew Holiday, the other other. So if you have your top four, your two stars, and then you have an other, he's the other other. All right. So Michael, what do you think about Drew Holiday? So I think Drew Holiday is an underrated pickup for the Butts because as the Butts experienced last year, they had a lot of trouble in close games because it was basically like, okay, Giannis can't create his own shot. Then everyone just keys on Chris Middleton. And bringing in Holiday really allowed them to go to the strategy like they've done this year and to really play – this ball movement type of game late in games because Drew Holiday is a good passer. He's able to create his own shot, but he can also score the bucket if he's got the open shot. So I think he was the perfect piece to put on this team because of the deficiencies that we've talked about for Giannis and Milton. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's funny because the guy that they had in the years past was Eric Bledsoe, right? And he struggled so hard in the playoffs. Drew Holiday is kind of just like the best version of Eric Bledsoe. It's like he's still really, really good at defense. I mean, one of the best, if not the best guard defender in the entire NBA. He isn't the guy that's necessarily you want to like create for you every single time, but he can create for himself. He can create for others. He's not the guy you necessarily want shooting the open three at the end of the game, but he can't, especially this playoffs. He's been very knocked down from three. He's been really, really important to what the Bucks are doing. I don't know if the Bucks are making this kind of run if they never add a Drew Holiday to their team, which, you know, at the time I had to look back, I think it was like 
six first round picks, like three picks and three swaps or something like that, that they gave, uh, gave up for Drew holiday. But if they win a championship, it's a hundred percent worth it. Yeah. He's yeah. Like you said, the better version of blood. So meaning that he plays good defense. He is a average creator. He might be a little bit above average scorer. And basically you are getting locked down defensive abilities. You're getting a little bit of creation and everything that he kind of scores is kind of bonus to where like, if he can knock down a couple of threes, get to the, get to the cup a couple of times, make some easy layups. If you can get 15 a game out of him, you're happy type of thing. And so, so far these playoffs, he's played like that so far in the finals. Eh, we'll wait and see. I mean, um, but he is definitely on the best team of his career and he needs to like kind of step up and show that he is the player that he is in the biggest couple of games of his career. The, the, the next couple of games in these finals are the biggest games of drew holidays, like very, very, very not illustrious, but like very, very good career. Yeah. He's had an extremely solid career. And honestly, there's been a lot of uh, bonus scoring I mean, he's scoring over 17 points a game since the playoffs has started. I mean, that's that's a little more than just, like, having, you know, your third guy score buckets when he can. I mean, he's been a vital part of this playoff. Run. Yeah, abs- I mean, absolutely. And I think that is that is the big upgrade that they made this year was moving on from Bledsoe and getting Drew Holiday. And he has proven to be worth every penny of it because here they are sitting in the playoffs. They – this game four is going to be big as we always talk about, as you always like to talk about Ethan game four is the most important game in the series because it's either going to go back two two and they're going to be even, or it's going to be three, one. It's going to be a very, very big hill to climb, but because of the addition of drew holiday, the bucks are even in this situation in the finals. They couldn't get past the second round with Eric Bledsoe being their starting point guard. So I think drew holiday is the other, other guy it, to me, it's still really close with him and Aiton. Aiton is the more fun guy to talk about because of his progression this year. But both of them are ma- vastly important to their respective teams. And now we get where it gets interesting I because my phone now I forgot who what either, the order is here. Bo- both teams have a big three: the Bucks being Giannis, Middleton, Drew Holiday; the Suns being Booker, Paul, Aiton. Why don't, before we get into the next three, why don't each of you guys say your top six real quick, just to remind everybody who your top six is. Michael, you go first. So at number one, I had Booker. Number two, Antetokounmpo. Number three, Middleton. Number four, Paul. Number five, Aiden. And then number six, Holiday. And mine's a little bit different, a little bit the same. Giannis, Chris Paul, Devin Booker, Chris Middleton, DeAndre Aiden, Andrew Holiday. And like I said, both teams have a, quote, big three. They have their their top three players, and then it's a significant drop-up. So now we go from everyday contributors to the, you know, the best of the team to when now we're in the role player category. So now it gets interesting. So, Mitch, I'll let you lead off. Who do you have at number six? I think that there is one guy who is the best best and most important role player of the two teams. And that is the young Mikhail Bridges. Mikhail Bridges comes in at number seven. He is another guy that is going to be a part of this core going forward for the Suns. He is an untouchable to me. If I'm Phoenix Suns, I have Booker, I have Aiton and I have Bridges. And like, obviously we're going to milk the everything we can out of Chris Paul for the next several years, but going forward, like Bridges is our guy. He has proven to be, amazing at defense he is a knockdown shooter he can even go and get his own bucket when things get really stagnant for the suns and the ball is in his hands for the last five seconds he goes and gets that little leaning elbow jumper which goes in a lot his arms are like freaking go-go gadget arms they go like to each side of the court it looks like the guy is is very long athletic and immensely skilled so he comes in as the top role player for me and michael who do you have so I didn't expect to rank this guy this high, but after looking at the numbers and then going back to fit for the Bucks, I'm going to go with Brooke Lopez. He's been pretty good this playoffs. He's scoring just over 13 points a game with six boards, which is pretty good on a team that has Giannis grabbing a lot of boards. And then Middleton grabs a decent amount of boards in his own right. 
And then he's able to both space the floor by shooting some threes, and he makes a decent clip. And then he's also able to guard big guys. And we've seen in the first couple of games in the finals that him being on the perimeter has made DeAndre Aiden a little uncomfortable. Uh, DeAndre Aiden can maybe guard a couple feet outside the key, but he's not used to being on the perimeter. And so Brooke Lopez has been really vital to uh, the Butts being able to come back in game three, and I think he'll be vital again in game four. Yeah, I, I think both of you guys hit the nail on the head of, of those two being the the two big role players for either team. I think Mikhail Bridges is an absolute stud in the making. I mean, he's the definition of three and D. Knockdown three-point shooter, like you said, arms that goes for days, a incredible defender, a lockdown type of guy. Um, I think he's just incredible. Um, and then Brooke Lopez, the, the, the big vet, you know, he's been there. He's done that. He's played in so many big games in his career and he's found a home in Milwaukee after bouncing around a little bit. And then just as been the stretch five that they needed to be around Giannis and is so vital to their success. So both of these players, very, 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 very vital to their teams, both very vital to their, their success. Both players, one of those things were like, at you know, at the half, both players could be leading their team in scoring, and it would not be out of the the norm, you know, type of thing. Where like Brooke Lopez could have you know fifteen or twenty at halftime, same with Mikael Bridges, and everyone would be like, oh yeah, he can do that. But then Mikael Bridges can you know guard their the other team's best player and lock down. And Brooke Lopez can get three blocks in a game, and both players very vital to their team's success. Um, I, I think both are very good options. I'm assuming the other two, like Mitch, I'm assuming Brooke Lopez is on your list later. I'm assuming Mikhail Bridges is on Michael's list later. So let's move on. You don't have to wait too long. Yeah, I was about <laughs> you don't to say. have to wait too long for me. Either. So there we go. <laughs> uh, I think that, that, that makes my little go both of them rant feel a lot better. So both of you, why don't you say who you have as your next player? So I got Lopez. Yeah. I'll go. So I, I got Lopez next. Um, yes, he is the guy that he fits so well in their scheme. Um, it's really funny where Brooke Lopez has been this really great scorer, former all-star, low post scorer his entire career, and he goes to Milwaukee like, hey, can you shoot threes? It's like, yeah, I mean, I can. No one really let me the entire time. It was like, all right, cool. Let's see how this goes. And all of a sudden, he's like a 45% three-point shooter. It's like, oh, wow. He's like shooting from like three, four feet past the line. It's like, wow, this guy can really shoot. And then they almost forgot that he can play down in the post. And then they lost Giannis for a little bit. And like, especially there in that Hawk series, they're like, uh, they're like, hey, let's put your against that like net series too. It's like, hey, they don't have really any big men. Let's put you down in the post. And then uh, all of a sudden, it's like, oh yeah, that's right. He has this great low post game also. And so he's just like you were saying, really important to the scheme of the team, being able to extend the floor, being able to guard centers when Giannis doesn't want to, being able to allow Giannis to do his thing, go clog the paint and go bull, roll, bull rush the rim. That's why he's really, really important. Yeah, and, you know, kind of the same thing that Mitch said about Mikel Bridges. Uh, he's been really good, and he's brought great energy to a Suns team where – you know, in the beginning, you know, Chris Paul got hurt, but Mikel Bridges came in and it didn't always show up in the stat sheet, but he brought great energy and really got the team going. Uh, the reason why I put Brooke Lopez over Bridges is just because Lopez has a few more points per game and a few more rebounds per game. But I was going back and forth between these two guys for pretty much all the reasons that Mitch stated earlier. And so there goes that that. Each team has like their go-to couple of role guys. I mean, you have Mikhail, you have Brooke Lopez, you have Aiton, you you know, you flip-flopped a couple of them, but, and, and yes, one might be better than the other and we can get into that, but that would make this podcast too long. So We're moving on, too long. so moving on, <laughs> I think this would be our eighth. This is nine. Nine. Yeah. Nine. nine? Oh nine my God. Ten. We're already at nine. Okay. So we got two more. So now, now we're into the crapshoot territory because I have no idea where you guys are going to go. Michael, why don't you go with your number nine player? All right. So number nine, I have a guy that has honestly been a personal favorite of mine for a long time, just because I love like the way that he plays. 
and just the toughness that he brings, and that's Jay Crowder. Uh, he's been extremely important to the Suns team, really gives them an edge off the bench that they really need. He plays solid D, and then he could also give you some buckets, you know, here and there. I mean, he's scoring just over 10 points a game during the playoffs and grabbing about four boards, which off the bench is all you could ask for. I mean, he's he's your quintessential energy guy off the bench. Yeah, he is a, a glue guy. Um, he is definitely very, very important to what the Suns do. I call him less douchey Marcus Morris, but that's just a personal thing I decided. <laughs> It might be just because the Mavs drafted him, but I just call him less douchey Marcus Morris. Um, but yes, I think he's very important to what they do. He knocks down just enough threes where you have to respect it. He brings that grittiness, that toughness. He's the guy that they're throwing at Giannis a lot of the time. Yes, they throw Aiton at him, Aiton at him as well, but when Aiton's not on the floor, they're throwing uh, you know Jay Crowder at him. And he's been that like grit and grind type of guy. Um, on every team he's been in, and he's played for a lot of teams. So he's he's the quintessential guy of like good enough to keep around, but not good enough to really keep around. So like he's very valuable, and he's been in the finals the last two years. So that can't go unstated. So a very good player at number nine, Mitch. Who do you have? So you know what's funny is when you were describing your guy, a guy that I've liked for a really long time, a really hard worker, tough nosed guy, like. My guy, like, I was like, oh, he's going to go with my guy, which is PJ Tucker. <laughs> which I, is also a less douchey Marcus Morris. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> uh, I've all, I've liked PJ Tucker for a really long time. When I was going to school, um, living in Phoenix, he's actually playing for the Phoenix Suns and was arguably their, you know, one of their top two, three best players was like Goran Dragic, which is kind of funny to see him playing for the Bucks playing against the Suns. Um, but he has been nothing but a consummate pro everywhere he's gone. He went to the Rockets. They're like, hey, can you play center? He's like, well, I'm 6'5", but I guess, yeah, let's give this a go. Uh, and now with this team, he, I have him above Jay Crowder for the reason of – I don't know if they can really get by the nets if Jay Crowder or if P.J. Tucker isn't right there in KD's shirt every single time. Obviously, Kevin Durant's going to go and get his regardless, right? But he was the guy that they are throwing at all of the best players just as like – almost like what Pat Bev was, or it's like, he's just the gnat. He's in your ear all the time. He's super strong. He's always moving you out of his, out of your spot. His points or his stats might be a little bit worse than Jay Crowder's, but, but like what he brings to the court, I think is really, really, really important, which is that like toughness, veteran leadership, able to hit the cor- that left corner three, man. He has made a lot of money because he can make a left corner three. And I, I want, I, if I had to choose between the two, I love both those guys, but I think right now I'd rather have PJ Tucker on my team than Jay Crowder. Yeah. I, I, again, another solid pick, uh, PJ Tucker, the shoe guy, the shoe which, guy, which he has over 5,000 pairs of shoes. Yeah. He, he actually, I saw a stat. He has more individual shoes than he has career points. I believe it, which is a <laughs> wild stat. But yes, he has more shoes than he has career points. And think about all the threes he's made. That's three pairs of shoes, or not three shoes, but three a pair and a half of shoes, which is wild. But yes, a very a very good solid pick. I think I'd pick Crowder over him just solely because Crowder offers so much more on the offensive end. Yes, PJ can you know be a dog on the defensive end, but so can Crowder. But yes, I I, I do like both those picks. Let's wrap this one up. Put a nice little bow on it. Let's uh let's see, Mitch, you can go first here. Who do you have at number ten? I got Jay Crowder. Wow, anticlimactic. <laughs> so he has Jay Crowder. I have Jay Crowder. Um, Jay Crowder, like we were just saying, he brings so much to the floor. He's your like great, great glue guy. He's been a great glue guy for a long time for a lot of teams. He's he's the only guy in in this finals that's been to a finals before, which is kind of funny. Um, and he's just like, he's just really good at everything, right? It's like, he can handle the ball just a little bit. He can play really good defense. He is shown to knock down. Like there's a lot of these shots. He's shooting these threes where it's like the up fake guy goes flying by him, takes that little side dribble. He's like leaning over to the left or leaning to the right a little bit. He's just knocked down with those threes. Very, very important. Kind of, we pretty much just described like the starting fives for both teams, but grounds out what the Phoenix Suns really needed going into this season. 
Yeah, and my number 10 guy is actually not P.J. Tucker, but Cameron Payne. And part of the reason is well, – That's a good pick. I had never heard of this guy before game one against the Lakers. <laughs> no idea. Couldn't have picked the guy out of a lineup. But then watching him play, he's had some really big moments. I mean, against the Lakers, I could personally attest, he was amazing. And then, you know, he's averaging right around 10 points a game, three boards, about four assists. For someone that's your backup point guard, I mean, that's really good. And he's been a really unexpected X factor for them throughout the playoffs. And he's been a really good energy guy. So I, I couldn't leave him off the list. I mean, Mitch brings up some good points about P.J. Tucker, but – just from what I've seen of campaign, he deserved to be on the list. Yeah, I'm very glad you brought him up because he is someone that I was going to bring up if no one did. And yeah, especially in the games where Chris Paul was out, he had like a 30 point game. Yeah. Playoffs, <laughs> uh, you know, where Chris Paul is out and was a starting point guard in a team that went 2 and 0 against the Clippers, who were healthy at the time. Um, so yeah, I, I, I really, I really think that, um, Cameron Payne is well worth it. You say you'd never heard of him. I bet you you have. Do you remember back in the day when Chris Paul, or not Chris Paul, uh, Russell Westbrook used to do the dances on the Thunder? Like way oh, back mean, when. Like way back mean, I knew his name. But he was the other guy. <laughs> he was the guy that used to dance with Russell Westbrook on the Thunder. Um, was out of the league. I, I The only reason I know this is because I, you know, out here in Dallas, we have the legends and it's one of the teams that, you know, Mitch and I pick up, you know, work for during the off season. And, um, he was on that team. And so I was like, Oh my God, that's the dance guy. And then I looked him up and like, kind of followed him. And like, I met him a couple of times, really nice guy, but, uh, he was playing in China. He like was out of the league for a year and now he's back, got an opportunity and is playing very, very well. A great story. Definitely worth noting. And yes, he has definitely earned himself another NBA contract and has been a huge X factor in these finals. I don't know if the Suns make it here without him. Yeah, I was going to say, from what I understand, he's a free agent this offseason and oh, he's probably going to make a couple million bucks. That guy's, so, someone's going to throw him like eight mil a year and it's going to be a mistake, but they're going to do it. <laughs> I will say so. I'm really happy you brought up campaign. He's had a great off season. The reason I went with PJ Tucker is because campaign has kind of fallen off ever since that 30 point game. He actually has been struggling a little bit. And so that's why I had PJ Tucker in there over, but I'm really happy you brought him up because he definitely deserves credit for what the Suns are doing, especially for coming in, stepping up big time in that Clipper series. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that wraps up our top 10 of each of them. Why don't Mitch, why don't you read off your top 10 real quick? Or right. do you need a minute to look it up? Oh, no, I got it here. All, I right, got it here. all right. Just all so right. everyone knows who your top 10 was. All right. I have Giannis, Chris Paul, Devin Booker, Chris Middleton, DeAndre Aiden as my top five. And then Drew Holiday, Mikhail Bridges, Brooke Lopez, PJ Tucker, Jay Crowder. And I want to give out my shout outs to Thanasis Antetokounmpo and Pat Connaughton, X Trailblazer, for being in the finals. My honorable mentions. There we go. There we go. Those are the, his honorable mentions. Michael, why don't you go through yours? So the correct list is Booker, Antetokounmpo, Middleton, Paul, Aiden, Holiday, Lopez, Bridges, Crowder, and finally, Payne. Wow. So he hits you with the, and the correct list is. Ah, well, that's your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to another episode of the Team Rail Podcast where we can't agree on anything and we're too drunk to care at this point. So that's the end of another episode. Um, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, Jameson, for being here. The IPA edition, I have to say that because I'm sure we'll have another real Jameson on in a little bit later and another podcast. Big Mike, thank you for joining us again. Mitch? Welcome back to another episode. I'm sure we'll do another one next week. Hopefully. You never Fingers know with crossed. us. Fingers <laughs> crossed. But we'll see you guys soon. So uh, cheers, everybody. Cheers.